Welcome back to the Chapel Grove Church Podcast, the Bible-centered show that focuses on searching the scriptures to find answers to common spiritual questions. To learn more, go to chapelgrovechurch.com. My name is Trevor Calvert. I'm a member at Chapel Grove Church of Christ, and I'll be your host for today's episode. And now, on to the show. On this week's episode, we will be considering the question, what is the will of God? In other words, what do people mean when they say that some event that occurred was the will of God? We also hear people say, and likely have even said ourselves, you know, it will happen if it's the Lord's will. But what exactly does this mean? If a natural disaster strikes, is that the will of God? If someone gets sick, is that God's will? If we are healthy and doing well, is that also because of God's will? We can pretty much sum up all of these questions into one by asking, is everything that happens in the world the will of God? And the answer is yes, but it is critically important that we first do a study of what all exactly God's will entails, not only so we can fully grasp this important topic, but also so that we can refer to it appropriately. One great passage we can turn to as an introduction to this study is James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. There the Bible says, Come now you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. All right, so first of all, what's the issue that James is addressing here? Very simply, he's pointing out a mistake that many seem to be making in the church in that day. They are continually thinking very boldly and presumptively about their plans for the future, as if these outcomes were all completely within their control. James says in verse 16 that this type of mindset is arrogant, and he even goes so far as to say that it is evil. To build on this point that James is making, let's look at a parable of Jesus. In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 20, there the Bible reads, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Here we see Jesus speaking to his followers about a man who has done very well for himself. He's had an excellent harvest, a bumper crop we might say, but he starts to get a bit arrogant and thinks he's made it to easy street. He breaks down his barns, builds bigger ones, and thinks that now he will be able to sit back and live the good life. It's smooth sailing the rest of the way. But God has other plans for this man. He calls him a fool and says his end is coming much sooner than he thinks, and that very night he would breathe his last breath. Well, what was this man's mistake? Was it that he was successful? Was it wrong that he had become wealthy? Was it wrong that he wanted to put his feet up for a bit and relax after all of his hard work? No, those things are not wrong in and of themselves. I don't believe any of those are the reasons God condemns the man. So where did the man go wrong? Well, he failed to include God in his future plans. He made preparations for the future, but he did not acknowledge that God rules supreme and therefore is in control of all things. The rich man had essentially become a god unto himself. He thought the outcome was entirely within his own power and therefore failed to realize who is ultimately in control, that is God. So going back to James chapter 4, what the writer is emphasizing to his readers is they need a change of mindset. They need a mindset that recognizes God for who he is, God the all-powerful being which is above everyone and everything. Nothing happens on earth apart from God's will. But then we come back to the question, what exactly is God's will? Well, there are essentially three categories of God's will. First of all, we find His determined will. This is also known as His absolute will. In his Contending for the Faith commentary over James, Doug Edwards states, 
Some events take place because God wants them to, and He takes the necessary action to see that they happen. It is God's will in the sense that He desired it and caused it. One obvious example we can consider is God's creation of the world. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 tells us, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It was God's desire to create the world, and we see that He accomplished it. Another example of God's determined or absolute will was to destroy the wickedness of the world during Noah's time. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 we read, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And then skipping down to verse 7, the Bible says, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Of course, we know how that story played out. God destroyed the world, save for Noah, his family, and the animals that were with him on the ark. God's will was done. So that's the first category of God's will, his determined or his absolute will. The second category is God's desired will, and this is also known as his preferred will. As Edwards explains it, there are some things that God wants that may or may not be accomplished because he has left them up to man to decide whether they will be accomplished or not. You know, God gave man the ability to have free will. God has made us aware of what he wants for us, but it is our choice whether we will obey his will for us. We are commanded by Jesus to do God's will. Notice Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, where Jesus says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. In Ephesians 5, verse 17, we read, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You can see how much we are encouraged and commanded to find out what God's will is for us. You may ask, how do we do that? Well, very simply, it's by reading the Bible, which is God's Word that He's imparted to us. One example of God's desired or preferred will we find in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. There we read, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, for some context on this verse, we find in verse 7 that God is going to destroy the earth with fire. And here we find in verse 9 that God is going to make good on his promise. And this is his absolute will. But we see the phrase, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is God's desired will or preferred will that every single human being choose to obey him and escape this destruction. However, some will choose to go the way of perdition and disobedience, and they will suffer the consequences. So that's God's desired or preferred will. Now, the third category of God's will is His permissive will. To introduce this section, I'll refer again to Doug Edwards' commentary. He writes, There are those acts that God neither purposes nor desires, but that He allows man in His freedom to bring to pass. God has the power to stop our lives at any time, but in most cases, He allows us to carry on without interfering. This is the type of God's will that's expressed in our introductory text in James chapter 4, verse 15. I'll read it again. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. This statement is an acknowledgement that God is in ultimate control and has the final say. We can make plans for the future, but we must recognize that everything is in God's hands. The Apostle Paul knew this truth very well. Listen to his words in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 19. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Here Paul makes clear his intentions to come visit the church at Corinth, but he humbly and wisely acknowledges that it will happen only if God allows it to be so. Again, this is God's permissive will. So going back to the sickness, natural disasters, and calamities that occur around the world, are these things according to God's will? The answer is yes, but not because God wants them to happen or even causes them to happen, but He allows them to happen. He permits them to happen. In closing, we've looked at three different categories of God's will. First of all, his determined or absolute will, 
This refers to the things that God wants and causes to happen. Secondly, there's his desired will or preferred will, the things that God desires, but he leaves up to man's choice whether they are going to obey it or not. And then thirdly, his permissive will, the things that God allows or permits to happen. I hope you found this brief study of the will of God beneficial and that it aids you in your understanding of our Heavenly Father. We hope you'll join us again next week for another episode of the Chapel Grove Church Podcast. Until then, take care. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more, go to chapelgrovechurch.com. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. It helps others find us and also lets us know how we're doing. Until next time, take care. Mm